But looking at this Spitfire, when we look at this was the primary dogfight plane, so to speak, for the Brits. And we look at as a short range. As were the German Messerschmitt, again, very similar plane in many respects. It also had about the same top speed, but only for a short time. Fuel consumption limit that to only about 20 miles of top speed. Look at that short flight duration. So these were very short and their maximum operational ceiling is six miles. Again, this would all change throughout the war. Three, four years from now, these numbers would be almost comical, but this is what, was, what they were looking at in 1940. When you look at the air assets, not a huge difference here. Not a significant difference. We see Germany has more total planes. They've got the faster climb rate. Their, their planes seem to have a faster maximum speed. But really, as our author kind of tells us over and over in the reading, when you look at this early stage, the battle for Britain, any differences in the planes were much more operators than they were the machines themselves. And looking at the tactical considerations, that's where that pilot experience would come in so valuable. So again, we can parse through who had the better planes, but I guess like most things in life, who had the better human assets. Germany encountered some tremendous operational problems. Bad weather is seemingly always the challenge in Britain. Uh, to a year and a half ago, I spent a summer there, and it just seemed to rain every single day. Germany had their resources spread too thin. And one of the things that's easy for us to do 60 years after the fact, with all the best research in front of us, is to make these critiques. But they were spread across an entire line, sending out a thousand sorties a day, and reality was they should have had a little more, what we might call precision bombing. Well, that's sort of always been an oxymoron even in 2013. And of course you send your fighter planes out to protect your dive bombers and again they had a high loss rate on the dive bombers and that's something Britain was very astute in attacking. Britain was very astute in going after those dive bombers not necessarily the Messerschmitts that were the dogfight planes. When you just look at this geographically understanding, like I say, it's just such a small area from France across the channel, 25 miles, and you can see some different security rings that were set up based upon the, you know, the miles that each plane had. This also reflects some of their radar capabilities, but radar, again, under any circumstance was uh, at its most infant stage at this time. Look at the number of German bases. We've got just scores of bases, but those are temporary bases. And so they have far more bases than Britain does, but certainly with permanent bases and permanent airfields came some natural advantages. The Germans were winning this. This was a multi-stage attack, and they were winning, but not fast enough, not fast enough. And this is a very significant point, and really, um, it kind of goes to your question a little bit earlier as to why Germany was holding back, why they let the escape at Dunkirk. Rules of war at this time, you wanted to avoid terrorism, and bombing civilians was terrorism, and thus, if you were doing indiscriminate carpet bombing of the city of London, that would brand you as a terrorist, and there would be ramifications for that. So early on here, London was not targeted. You were targeting the various military assets. And that was a strategic decision made by the Germans. Again, they were winning, not winning fast enough, and it was not part of their plan. Now, clearly any war, from one quick second, from start to finish evolves in so many ways. And World War II would ultimately evolve into the total war. And we'll see more of that when we look at the 
final bombing of Tokyo and of course Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, sir. Yeah, was the United States involved on the side of Britain during this time? At this time, we are not. We are sending over a small number of pilots, literally less than 100. And we really do not have what we call the Lend-Lease program up and running yet. That would come. Well, this would, would been, push us out of neutrality. Would been one of the reasons why Hitler didn't want to support this immigrant? <laughs> because of the involvement, possible involvement of the United States? You know, I think partially, but not necessarily. Remember, the United States had been in a period of isolationism for the better part of the last 11 years. Britain was still the <coughs> world empire. And in many respects, Adolf Hitler wanted that British respect. So was the US, I and mean, yes, it was a consideration, but I don't believe it was a strong consideration. I really do not. The idea of getting, earning legitimacy from Britain was a, the primary thing. George, you got some comments well, on I that? Think the, I think the other thing you have to look at is our <coughs> role, the United States' role in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. We're the equivalent of the Chinese to the United States today. We're the, we were the economic power that was menacing everybody. Now, if your largest economic power, Britain at the time, Remember that by the 1940s, <coughs> everything is equated to the British pound. If the British are getting their heads handed to them, and you can make money by selling things, you're going to do it. But you don't have to come running to their aid. If you run too quickly, what's going to end up happening? You're going to end up giving your stuff away. So Roosevelt's policies, if you look at them, are rather constrained. Yeah, he's saying, I'll help you, I'll give you a lend-lease, I'll do these things, but he doesn't do it what? You were Facts. talking about the famous fireside chats? Uh, well, the fireside chats were going on all, all through the oh, 30s. Right. Yeah, but it, it was leading up to this. Right. Remember, the tacit U.S. policy. If you're Roosevelt, you want to come out of this whole experience in what? The top country in the world. It has to be in the back of his mind. Remember, the British up to this point are the leaders, They're the imperial leaders. Sun never sets over the British Empire, right? We're the ones that are selling, we're trying to break through. Your competitor is in trouble. What happens? You want to make sure that your competitor continues to struggle. It's too bad. You're in a war. Well, let's buy things from us, but we're not going to come running to your aid. We're not going to load the ship to the gills and give it to you. Sell it to you. And remember, it's lend. Lease. Lease means what? Pay. Rent. The idea was, we'll give it to you, but you're going to have to eventually what? Pay. And I think the analogy is, if my neighbor's home is on fire, I'm supposed to lend in my what? Garden hose. Well, the garden hose, last time I checked, doesn't quench the fire, right? The fire department comes with a garden hose, you got a problem. Might help you in the interim maybe wet the thing down until the real people show up. And maybe Roosevelt knows that eventually he's going to get stuck in it. And we'll talk about that very specific thing. We're not shocked, even though we are surprised at Pearl Harbor, we must have had a sense that some of this might have been coming.